Everyone get enough popcorn? Yeah. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Andrea Kapair. I'm uh, with Thurston Community Media, and we're proud to uh, partner with the Olympia Film Society and the Capitol Theater in bringing you the first uh, meaningful movie site in Thurston County. So thank you for joining us for this inaugural uh, screening. Um, I uh, wanted to invite my friend Shauna Hawk up from uh, COA and Media Island. She had some things to say about our local radio station. Or I could just hand this down to you. Hello, everybody. I just wanted to um, make sure that you knew that we, uh, we have our radio station, COA 106.5 FM. We're a Pacifica affiliate, and it's 24-7 public affairs. You can mostly hear us downtown, a little bit of the west side, a little bit of Lacey, but you can live stream on KOWALP.org, and we're happy to support um, this in TC Media. So um, thank you for coming out tonight. So I would like to uh, introduce some of our panelists tonight. And our first panelist is Deborah Vinsel. She's the CEO of Thurston Community Media. Our next panelist is Dr. R.T. Young, and she is a professor at the Evergreen State College. And Peggy Smith is with the League of Women Voters. So our conversation tonight will be about the the film and its impact to us in Thurston County. So my first question uh, for you all is your initial thoughts on the film. Maybe we'll start with uh, Peggy since uh, your microphone's set. Okay. Oh, I'm on. Can you hear me? Okay, hi. Um, I, I was impressed to know now that I can say I'm from the Communist League of Women Voters. <laughs> I think that was my favorite line. Um, generally speaking, I'm an action thriller fan, but um, there were certainly some points made in this movie that I think we all need to take to heart. Sometimes I think we're living not only in the upper most west part of the country, but in an island that we don't understand, or at least I don't, all that's going on. So I appreciated um, seeing this film and realizing that there are a lot of people that are influenced in a negative way by money. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank you very much for inviting me and for showing this film. It awakened something that had been lying dormant in my heart and my soul when the issues around voting were raised, and especially toward the latter part of the film, I could not help but reflect on the other part of what the struggle for voting rights did in African American communities. For instance, I remember a family who quite literally had to move from the area and live with friends for a while in Washington, D.C., because their daughter had been in college and was protesting and advancing the right of African Americans to vote. Her mother had been a teacher. She was fired from her job. Her father had a blue collar job. He was fired. They were receiving death threats because their college aged daughter was protesting and marching with a group of students in downtown Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And today, she's the daughter, Janet. Hostin is, re is retired, but she was a professor for many years at Howard University. She was a history professor. She has published broadly. And I had to, I thought about her. 
I thought about the hundreds of lives of citizens who lost their jobs, not just the Hostons, but I thought about Janet and her family in particular. But getting out there on the line and fighting for your rights was a dangerous thing to do. And so I salute all those who went before me, who paved the way for me to be able to go to college unfettered and for me to get a superior education at the University of Michigan and at University of Puget Sound. Thank you. Uh, so I uh, approached this the the screening specifically with you know kind of a look toward the media. Um, I uh, am turns I turned sixty in May. So as far as my upbringing through uh, the years of um, rights movement, I'm kind of really a little bit too young to have been actively engaged in that process. Kind of came on the back end of it. Um, but I grew up in the foothills of south of southeastern Ohio in Appalachia and um, I grew up in a Republican family uh, my grandmother was the secretary of the Republican Party and when I see uh, what I believe to be uh, pretty thorough journalistic reporting and effort to tell a story like this um, and I see how um, uh, our political process has changed. I, I can't help but think that my grandmother probably would not consider herself a Republican today mm -hmm. um, because of just the changes that we've seen. I, I do tend to have a much more progressive attitude now than I did many, many years ago. But I do joke with my coworkers that I learned all of my mass mailing skills, helping my grandmother put out mailings, you know, before the years of computers. So, you know. <laughs> um, but anyway. Um, uh, I think it's, um, I, I really landed, the point that really landed with me, and I don't know if it, it landed with uh, many of you, but was when um, he said that his work was not being recognized or shared by American media, that it was being uh, limited to European media. And I, you know, as a media person, found that to be pretty incredible. <laughs> um, especially considering our media landscape these days, which is uh, fairly polarized. And I'm, I can think of several outlets that <laughs> would, this would, be a, would have, a, would have a, uh, a sense of this. So, um, you know, it, 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 the, this film covered so many different topics and so many different points and all brought it back to this issue of looking at how our um, brothers and sisters are being denied the right to vote through some kind of um, data management gymnastics. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it really, it caused me to check my privilege a little bit, um, uh, but also caused me to go, you know, we as a media organization here in Greater Thurston County try very hard to make sure that information about candidates and issues are covered and provided and uh, to think that it seems to be relatively easy for um, our fellow citizens' rights to vote to be infringed upon is a very scary thought. And I don't know if you all know this, but tonight we're wrapping up the end of Free Speech Week. So uh, be excited that you're here watching this film, listening to this conversation. Uh, at such a time. Um, but speaking of that, um, we went over money a lot in this film. So if we could, you know, touch on how does money, did we, did we cover that enough in the film? Do we want to share any additional thoughts on how money impacts our freedom of speech? Well, it's obvious it affects uh, freedom of speech in a very real way. All we have to do is turn on the tube, listen to the music, listen to the, uh, the music of democracy in America. That is words coming out of the mouth of the President of the United States, words coming out of the uh, mouth of his chief of staff, 
our students being inundated with all sorts at, on my college camp campus, all sorts of, I would have to say, it's, a, it's akin to just tickling the, vo the nerves of protest and causing them to lose a sense of direction in terms of the relationship of the First Amendment right. And I think that was not an accident that the founders put freedom of speech, the right to speak. There are some constraints on speech, but in the main, we have the right to call the president a liar when he's lying as the congresswoman did when he came after her with fervor because she was sitting in an automobile. And I don't know how many of you have ever just had your phone on and friends around and you're talking to, I know I see my granddaughter doing it all the time. Three girls in a room and they're having a conversation with someone else and they're listening to everybody else talk. However, this was a little different. The congresswoman was in the car with her friends of many years, her former student. She had been a high school, I mean, a, high, a, a public school principal. She knew these people and they were, she was there to share with them the loss of a very valued human being. This was a man with a family and she was there with them, and she merely responded to what they had said. So I think that's the most striking example right now today. But let me go to Evergreen and talk about what happened over there. I think that was taken totally off the mark. There were students who were protesting. They were protesting what they considered to be racial disparity on the campus. They had well-organized plans, but they truly had no understanding of the First Amendment. This quarter, I am teaching constitutional law, and I will do moot court next quarter. If they had one class in government or one class in constitutional law, just a survey, no in-depth kind of thing from the time they hit the campus. I believe things would have been a little bit different on the campus, but I know this. The media came, and the media came for a story. And what they filmed, I'm not altogether sure it was actual fact that they filmed. But I know once I was coming through the library and I saw all these lights and I saw this man sitting on a chair and someone sitting across from him with a camera. I did not realize that the press was in the inside of Evergreen at the time, for instance. I'm saying that the right to speak certainly is available to all, but the right to strike at and to engage in any form of violence is actually prohibited. And so I think sometimes our students are acting so emotionally that they don't necessarily, and human beings and adult persons as well, obviously, but I'm, I guess I'm more concerned about students on the campus because I am a college professor and that's who, who I'm, most often with would be students and uh, certainly some staff. But the point that I'm trying to make is we need to offer real history in public schools because people get a very wrong idea of history. It's like there were just a bunch of animals here who looked like human beings at the beginning and we came to the state of Washington and we got rid of all of that and we took over and made it all very nice. This is essentially the story that's told in his history classes. We need to demand object objectivity and no subjectivity in reflecting reflecting on and writing about history. We need to clean up the educational system in that respect. 
Whose textbooks, for instance, do we buy? Who selects the textbooks that we tell our students they must read? Who does that? If you don't know, I think it's a good thing to try to find out who's doing that in Thurston County. Who selects the people who sit on these textbook panels? Who reads the books before they select them? I think our students come to campus with misinformation, just as the adults. We, we grew up during the system because that was it. It wasn't many until many years after high school that I learned history. I learned the history about my own people, that is African Americans, learned the history of my other people who were Scottish. I learned the history of America when I was well into my adult years. In fact, I learned history when I was team teaching with an historian. I am telling you that there is something wrong in terms with what we teach our kids because these ideas about what is, what happened, what didn't, black people did not have any rights not very long ago. In fact, in the Dred Scott trial, Justice Tannis, Tanny said that black people had no rights that a white man was bound to respect. If you don't believe me, read the Dred Scott case. So this is not new stuff that's happening. It has been embedded. It is a part of our DNA. And it is definitely a part of the history that we advance in the United States. I'm sorry, I talked. It's about. okay. No. Well, that that. Uh, thank you. It's very true. Thank you very much. I I didn't really prompt her, but I will say that the League of Women Voters of Washington State does, in fact, have a civics textbook that we are um, encouraging school districts to use. I don't know if you know that it's been about 30 years that civics was not a required subject in Washington State schools. The League, um, in collaboration with some other organizations, got a law passed that said that now civics does need to be taught, um, not as rigorously as we would like, but we have a textbook that is now coming into its eighth edition and will be encouraging um, teachers in our public schools to get teacher training in actually presenting this curriculum. So you may, um, there'll be a, a bill introduced this session that you might be interested in following really to be able to get people to understand their role in government and the importance of the vote. Now, in terms of thinking about big money, how many of you have actually, you've heard of Citizen United? They spoke of it in this film. Well, Citizens United basically says that corporations are people. And, excuse me, persons, and by virtue of that, then they can commit, I mean, they can provide money to campaigns of individuals. And that's a large portion of where big money in campaigns is coming from now. And what that does in large measure is discourage individual people from voting. It dampens individuals' desire to vote, and um, that's why there are moves afoot now to get public support, public financing for voting, and that's a way in Washington State where, fortunately, we're not part of the, the code or whatever it's called, but a way to encourage individuals and inform individuals and enable them to really be confident that their vote makes a difference. And as the fellow said in the film, well, it would take lots of individuals. Well, it does money-wise compared to the big money 
that's being put into so many elections now, but every every bit helps. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think um, that one of the things that when we think about money, and of course in this particular in the film, he focused on um, where sources of money came from specifically to move these voter suppression initiatives forward, and you know they came from just a handful of resources basically, mm -hmm. and that. That in and of itself, I think, is enough to freak anybody out that, you know, four or five individuals can wield enough uh, financial resource to to make those kinds of, of things uh, possible. But I also look at it from the from a perspective of just how much money gets spent on elections now compared to how much money gets spent on elections in previous years. I don't have any specific statistics. I just know that the 2012 um, Obama campaign spent more than a billion, with a B, dollars on that campaign. So that's a pretty phenomenal amount of money. Um, most of it in a great part being used to affect media uh, presentation, uh, you know, what happens, what people see. And of course now we're um, our media landscape has changed so significantly with the um, ubiquitous nature now of so many social media platforms, and we know that the Obama campaign was um, genius at harnessing that as a new form of communications that other campaigns had not used in the past. Um, but when you think about how much money it takes to make the kind of media presentation to an audience, and we no longer have the fairness doctrine. Um, so, and of course, again, the media landscape has changed. The fairness doctrine was uh, a requirement specifically toward broadcasters in, you know, back in the day when that's, there were only three channels. Uh, as the one gentleman said, there were only three channels. I was like, yeah, there were only three channels. Um, so, um, uh, I kind of lost myself there. Um, the amount of money it takes to to reach a mass audience is so much greater now than it used to be um, that um, people who don't have means or don't have access to the means um, are behind the eight ball when they start. I think the Sanders campaign this year was so phenomenal because as Bernie often reminded us it was however many millions of people with an average of $27 donation. Um, that was just a huge change from what we had seen in past campaigns. And, um, you know, without, oh, the Fairness Doctrine, uh, the, the Fairness Doctrine used to require that uh, broadcasters provide equal opportunity to all candidates. So if you, if you ran a story about candidate A, you were obligated to run a story about candidate B or give candidate B an opportunity to, re to rebut or respond to, and that doesn't exist anymore. So that's why we see so many um, heavily skewed reports about one candidate or another, depending on the news outlet you're uh, looking at. So, um, I and the and the other thing that wasn't really brought up a lot in this in this movie, but, but I think um, for all of us, I think we would all enjoy seeing a shorter campaign cycle. But uh, <laughs> you know, these three and four year campaign cycles are a little bit um, uh, outrageous. So uh, so money's huge. Money is huge. I could I just say one thing because I, that was a very important point uh, that you made about. The, what's happening with uh, with civics, because they did cut it out for a long time, civics in public school. Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, former uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, many years ago joined together with uh, another guy, and they came up with something called iCivics, I-C-I-V-I-C-S, and it is online. And uh, students can go online, learn lots about civics. It's a it's well developed website now. Uh, when it first started out, it was a little sparse, but now it's just grown into this monumental uh, tool for instruction, and it's fun uh, for the kids to be involved in that. So I highly recommend that if you're not aware of it, iCivics is a good source for learning about government. I'm going to go a little off script with my next question. Having just watched the film and uh, having gone through our last election cycle, I want to talk about that data piece between cross-check, I-360, and uh, the sort of 
social media uh, driven behavioral change that we saw with the use of Cambridge Analytica and other tools that were uh, leveraged to um, move voters in a direction that they may not have gone through had they not seen certain news in their newsfeed. Um, and it, it's really a matter of media literacy. Um, when people are engaging with social media, being able to discern what is a, a truthful source and what is not. And as we saw, Greg Palace definitely had this uh, agenda with this film. He used a lot of uh, visual and textual elements to get his point across. So if we could just talk a minute about media literacy and its impact in, in the election. Uh, yeah, well, you know, if you see it on the internet, it must be true. Um, and that, I think, pretty much sums it up. I think, um, it, hmm. <laughs> that's a really, a it's a lot, it it's a, a big lot. question. Um, um, digital and media literacy, I think, is critical. Um, um, we, we all know a seven-year-old that can run the laptop or the iPad or the computer better than any other adult in the family. So the digital literacy part of it, I think young people are probably got a fairly good handle on it um, in, in terms of the mechanics of it. But the, um, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Um, consumer discretion piece, maybe, being able to discern um, what should be and shouldn't be um, believed. Uh, that's a harder piece. There was a study done kind of a little uh, social media trick more than anything, um, not too long ago about, um, with a group of young people, um, telling them that, uh, here's a story, there was a story on the internet and they were asked to read the story and, this, and then ask what they wanted to do about it. And the story was about the demise and soon to be extinction of the Pacific Northwest tree octopus and complete with art, where there was a, a dug fur with an octopus in it, you know, and, um, and it was so well-crafted and so well-written that the young people who read the story, um, without trying to find any other source for the, real, the reality of the Pacific Northwest tree octopus, um, put a campaign together to save the tree octopus <laughs> because they were so taken in by the story that they read. And, uh, you know, it was, it was an example of how easy it is to convince people of something, convince people of the truth when the truth does not exist. And um, we are hearing about that a lot these days with the impact of um, uh, fake news stories on Facebook in particular and other news sites and how they were um, pinpointed and directed towards specific voter groups in order to potentially change uh, their vote in the last election. So along with civics, <laughs> education, because it still does amaze me how many people really don't understand how our system of governance works, um, that that piece of media literacy and how to become a, um, I don't ever want to say, I don't ever want people to be um, what, skeptical, is that the word I'm looking for? Um, yeah. Um, I want to use the word critical thinking. Critical thinkers, That's thank you. Yeah, critical thinkers yes. about, about the media they consume. Yes. Yes. Um, um, because there's a ton of it out there, well, more than there is, ever used to be. Right. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say this is a new problem, mm -hmm. however. Mm -hmm. But um, it does have an impact in, how to say, the the current belief that the people aren't talking. Well, I'm not sure they're not talking. I think they're just not listening. And the newspaper mm -hmm. is talk, talking, but unless you are read it with a somewhat of an analytical eye, you're not really listening. And um, I think the, the data that they presented, that people, it, it's mind boggling to me. I, that people would really buy into that, but they do. <laughs> I'd like to echo uh, your uh, position there with respect to critical thinking. I think that's one uh, area of study that needs to also be included in our public schools, primarily because people don't think. 
Whatever the last thing that was stated is, is said, somehow or other, that becomes the truth. And I don't know what fake news means. I'll be real honest with you. Is that the truth, or is it not the truth? I look at it from a, because fake news, it's like anything. It's almost like a saying now, oh, fake news, oh, fake news. It's nothing. It has no meaning to it. I don't know. Wh if someone makes a statement, and they haven't created a building or an artwork or anything like that, they've just made a statement. What happened to, is that true or not? Upon what basis are you making that statement? How can you verify that fact? I think we need to really turn our heads into something akin to reasoning, mm -hmm. the process of reason, how, reasoning. How does one reason? That's learned behavior. That's a, that's a subject. That's something that we don't, we're not necessarily born with because we're born with a kind of a response, a physical response, something that is almost automatic. But reasoning and thinking are developed over time. And I think we need to call for that. And when we hear someone say, oh, fake news, what do you mean by fake news? Well, it's not true. Well, how do you know it's not true? And you, you go through some of these very easy kinds of tools for developing that skill. I agree. Um, while you were talking, I was thinking about a, um, an experience I had with my 90, almost 90-year-old 90 mother. And she lives in, still lives in our, my childhood home in, in southeastern Ohio. And I took her grocery shopping. And there are several very nice grocery stores where she lives that are, you know, like grocery stores, you're common. They're big. There's, they've got tons of options. And she prefers to go to this much smaller, more expensive, but much smaller grocery store that's kind of um, owned by a local family. And I said, oh, it's really nice that you like to support the Campbells. And she goes, no, it's just easier for me to shop here because when I go down the condiment aisle, there's only four kinds of ketchup to choose from instead of 30. <laughs> you know, and, and, and to her, I mean, because, you know, it, it, it's just visually and, frankly, just emotionally taxing to her to have to ride a little cart down the aisle to buy ketchup and find, you know, for 50 different varieties and sizes and prices and, you know, it just overwhelms her. And I think that's what has also happened to so many of us with our media landscape this day. We have 50 kinds of ketchup to choose from and so we don't choose any or we, you know, choose the closest one or the one that's, you know, closest to our sensibility um, in terms of what the story is, or the tried and true, you know, the one that we've always gone to, even though maybe it doesn't taste the best, <laughs> you know. And I think that's happened to us with our media landscape. It's just become somewhat overwhelming because there's so much, and it comes at us so quickly. You know, when we were young and we only had three television channels to choose from, the news cycle truly was 24 hours or even 48 hours, you know, something would happen and it might be two days before the news agency ran it down and made a story for you. Now it's, you know, every five minutes there's a new, a new headline or a new piece um, or sometimes just a new spin on something. I don't know about you, but I get really frustrated watching the cable channels in the afternoon when they're all telling you the same thing over and over and over again and nothing ever new comes out. But this show's going to talk about the story, and this show's going to talk about the story, and the next show's going to... But there's no new information. It's just maybe a new take on the, on the information they already have. So um, I think some critical thinking about what we consume as media consumers is certainly a skill that we need to teach. But having access to the information that you want to analyze is also important certainly struck by the fact that he could not get a hold of the list mm -hmm. for a very long time. And everyone was saying it was confident, 
confidential. Well, that brings me as a league member to wanting to see more transparency in how money is spent. And we have disclosure laws that are not adequate to enable a real, um, you know, a normal person to delve into some of that. I'm thinking about the map where it starts up here with Coke and then went all the way down on both sides. Well, if you can't get information, if you can't go and find out who's behind this entity and who's behind that one, et cetera, et cetera, then of course it's hard to know the truth or to even begin to analyze that. So um, thinking about more transparency in elections and in funding elections particularly, I think is something that um, we should be encouraging. And I just got our five minute sing signal. Okay. So unfortunately we do have to wrap up, right. um, but uh, I invite everyone to uh, maybe approach uh, uh, if anyone has a question, a question. we do. A, we have oh, yeah, two questions. Okay, two, okay. Three, so let, let's go with four. some questions. <laughs> okay, I was going to ask. Um, so we just watched the film about the Voting Rights Act, and uh, there were a lot of. We saw maps where different states were highlighted. So we live in the state of Washington, and if we wanted to do something, you know, for example, get in touch with the League of Women Voters or. What, what can we do uh, to help bring this to sunlight? The question was, what can we do as Washingtonians to support voter rights? I'm not sure that it's a matter of whether you're saying, can we point out what's happening over here, or can we do something to make sure that we continue on a, a good path in Washington? And so from the lead perspective, I would say just be attuned to some, there, there are things called voting right acts that are being introduced in our legislature. And so that would be the, the simplest thing to do. I, I would, I would um, also like to remind us, myself included, that in a couple of years now we're going to go we're going to be doing have a new census, right? Right. Okay. And we're, we'll have some redistricting kinds of things because one of the biggest problems in some of these southern states in particular has been gerrymandering or gerrymandering, as some people say, because the guy's name was Gary who came up with this concept. But uh, I think that's one thing, one way to get involved. And I think it's important to follow your, your whoever represents you. It's very easy to follow what bills are coming before them, uh, where, find out where your uh, particular representative senator or member of the House, where they are on issues, provide your responses. I have students who whatever, I don't care what they, what position they are, Republicans or whether they're Democrats, I really don't care. But I do want them to be involved and they make phone calls and they write emails. And so when an issue is coming before the Washington State Legislature, I think the people's voices must be heard. That is the only way that we have of getting the kinds of uh, results uh, that we would like. I should bring her we'll with me every here. time I go someplace <laughs> because the League of Women Voters has just done and put on their website a study of redistricting. So if you have any interest in that, it's I'm going to do the initials for League of Women Voters of Washington. That's well, you, the, you know those initials, dot org. We have a question here and a question. Pacifica Radio, support chaos, support democracy now. Amy Goodman, I've seen great, great palace. I used to live in D.C. He came down all the time. He wrote that book yeah. during the Bush years. Right. Yeah. He was in the Secretary of State, Catherine Harris's office, stealing documents that proved that the Florida election was stolen. Mm -hmm. You know, if Gore had contested it with the Black Caucus, 
Support Amy Goodman. Support Democracy Now. Support The New Yorkers doing all sorts of great articles. Vanity Fair. There's a lot of investigative journalism mm -hmm. going on. And subscribe to these things. Help keep the Mother Jones is going on. But the Pacifica stations, Amy Goodman, she's had she's had Greg Palast in town all the time. Mm -hmm. She has Howard has Howard Zinn on about true history. You know, Tom Hardman show has Greg Palast on all the time too. Mm -hmm. So support the local Pacifica. Thank you. And you can also listen to Amy Goodman on YouTube. My students, we look at and yeah, we do. We look and at her. And on TC Media Channel and 22 well, twice a day. You. I'm learning. I'm learning. And on, and on, and on, and on, and on Chaos. And on Chaos. And uh, you had a question. The question that I was going to do that plug. So Pacifica, we're called KOWA 106, and we play in the yeah. Great. And she needs fun. So we, we, so we right. play, but we also play the Ralph Nader Report, Rising the Sonali. And our table over there actually has a flyer of all the shows we play. So we hear a lot about Amy Goodman. There's so many other uh, mm -hmm. powerful um, mm -hmm. shows and, uh, Thank that you. are definitely worth being heard and being uh, to know about. They don't get the same kind of funding mm -hmm. and recognition. So check out Co 106.5. But my question was, when you were talking about fake news, and I'm wondering, um, all of your thoughts, but definitely you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Young, around African American communities in particular having to always deal with fake news. Because in the film, they alluded to birth of a nation. That was fake news. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we've always had to deal with that and be the critical thinker. But what more is That was one of the most racist movies ever, ever <laughs> uh, written or ever produced in the United States. And I'll tell you, it burns me up every time I hear somebody who's teaching filmmaking showing this movie because of the new techniques that it, that it employed. Well, you're talking about killing human beings, stringing them up and all of that. That is a horrible piece. But I'm glad he put, he, oh, he didn't put the whole thing. He showed the images of strange fruit mm -hmm. hanging from the trees. Um, it, and so I thought it was, it, it fit very well with the story he was telling. But in the main, uh, generally just running that piece, it, that film is, it, it always, it terrifies me. As a child, I actually witnessed up front and close a Klan rally. It is not something you will ever forget. Question in the back. And that is our last question. Okay, okay. La our last question in the back here. I just wanted to point out that on civics, uh, I'm an elected official in this county, countywide, and uh, that, you know, I, I was born in New Hampshire. New Hampshire has a very strong ethic to vote because it's the first primary in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, while I don't think that process is fair that they get to vote first, I nonetheless realize that they teach civics in high school and have always required it. Um, so what is it that is needed to get the culture to realize the importance of civics as New Hampshire has? And as New Hampshire is very proud of also having an extremely open primary for anybody to file for the president. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the ethics of that and trying to get that Accentuate when you were talking about what journalism has degraded itself into these days. One needs to only, I had a friend go to journalism school to realize what efforts they do in trying to maintain at least the premise of fact checking, <laughs> that, which is gone by the way boards, even in papers like uh, the New York Times, you know, Mr. Blair, for example. Um, so, Sometimes, you know, even our own institutions are failing us today, even the ones we expect not to. And um, I just wonder how we're going to correct the course of that, let alone trying to encourage people to be involved in civics and know the value of black individuals in the first place. Well, I'll speak to the media piece, and if somebody else wants to speak to the civics piece. Um, as far as media is concerned, um, I'm a believer that we get what we ask for. And if we don't ask for better, we will never get it. Um, there are people in boardrooms and creative offices, you know, around the world going, oh, here, we can create this piece of, whether it's news media or entertainment media or whatever, um, and pump it out to us. You know, we went through this whole period of time where reality TV became so such a popular genre, and we all know it is 
it is anything but real. You want to see reality television, watch a city council meeting. That's as real as it gets, you know. Um, but it, got, it was inexpensive to produce, and they just poured it out. And I had a bout of insomnia and was up one night and, you know, channel surfing the 300 channels of nothing to watch at 2 o'clock in the morning and couldn't find anything that wasn't just, you know, appealing to the basis instinct of humanity and, and couldn't help but think, you know, they're not giving us, they say they're giving us what we want, they're not giving us what we want because we're not telling them what we want. We're not being vocal about this is not the kind of media environment we want to have. So I think, you know, it's real important to talk back to the media and, you know, they've all got Facebook pages and Twitter feeds and letters to the editor and all of that, just say, you know, your coverage sucks, do better. Did time when you want to talk about the civics piece? Because we no, we've got to too, wrap it. It's, an, it's, yeah. so, it's too so. hard. That's too hard a to question. No, I think I, think, I can't we, answer. I think we're at the end of the program. Reagan, who took civics out of the federal schools for teaching, he also made ketchup a vegetable. A vegetable. Yes, he in did. the school lunches, right? <laughs> right. And he Thank also you. cut back on mental health services <laughs> as well. Can we all give our panelists a round of applause? Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh. oh. Oh.